Frank's world renowned for his work in Costa Rica with the leatherback sea turtle. And uh, he's an, a wonderful example of, of our faculty and what, what they have to offer. He works extensively with students from IPFW and, and also with prominent colleagues from around the world on sea turtles and other conservation issues. And he's also been an important formative example uh, for me as, as I've been here at IPFW. And uh, he's going to speak to us today about uh, some of the things that he's learned over a bit of work and a bit of time uh, looking at the ocean and working with sea turtles. So, Frank? <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Um, I know all of you came here to see a talk about sea turtles. And I am going to talk about sea turtles, but uh, the emphasis on my, in my lab has included many other organisms as well. So I thought I'd throw a curveball to all of you and start talking first about a project that is uh, very exciting by a master's student here at IPFW just finishing up, uh, Sam Frederick. And a uh, colleague of mine at Cornell University, who was a f my first PhD committee student, and uh, he's now a professor at Cornell University, and that's looking at uh, the movements of large Pacific sailfish, uh, which are kind of fun to understand and to learn about. One of the major reasons is because nobody has been able to, prior to this time, track these animals in the ocean. Uh, one of the problems with large Pacific predators uh, like sharks and billfish is that they're sought after and caught on long lines. Industrially, that has caused a real problem and the populations of these animals have declined precipitously in the last few years. Uh, because of that, it's imperative for us to start understanding what they do, where they go, and what influences their movements so that hopefully uh, when their numbers become so few, we can start protecting some of the important areas in the ocean where these animals need to either go and forage, to reproduce, and to live. Um, the problem is how do you monitor a large fish? Uh, I've used satellites with sea turtles, and one of the advantages with sea turtles is they breathe air. So every time they come up to the surface, if you put a transmitter on the animal and it breaks the surface, It'll send a signal up to a satellite that is orbiting the Earth, and you can get that information. You can get all kinds of information, not only location, but you can get heartbeats. You can get information that's stored in an archival computer system, which tells you how many times they've died, how deep they dive, how many times they've gone down, how long the dives are. But how do you do that with a fish? Well, we're just so lucky to have a fish, this uh, sailfish, because of its behavior, breaks the surface of the water and jumps out of the water. And during those brief interludes, you have a window of a few seconds while they're out of the water to actually get this information as well. Also, many of them will cruise along the surface. And while they're doing that, if your transmitter breaks the surface again as well, you can get information from them. So what we did was we designed a transmitter that we could use to put on these uh, animals. We used uh, sport fishermen uh, locally there who are very interested in knowing where these fish are going and what they're doing, not only because their industry depends on them being there and being able to predict where they are so they can catch them, but also to try to help understand what impact their practices have. Uh, they have a catch and release uh, philosophy where once they catch the fish, they don't keep it, they release it back so some other fishermen can catch them. Does that work? When you release it, does the fish just sink down to the bottom and die? So the questions are important and interesting and ones which we can provide some answers and hopefully uh, uh, also understand the basic movements and biology of these animals. So some of the traditional limitations of using telemetry on these animals is the high cost of the tags. Each one of those tags costs between two to $5,000, depending on what you use it for. And uh, so putting out just a statistically significant number of animals, uh, in this case, you would want at least 10 animals that you could track, 
right there can be twenty to fifty thousand dollars and so getting agencies to fund you and being able to write is important that's why i tell all my students if you're interested in biology you better also be interested in being able to write being able to write your information down so that you can convince someone else wow this is a really neat project i think we should give this person the money and this person can now go do the work so that's why I'm very happy our students are here at IPFW. We have a wonderful English department does a great job of teaching our students how to write well. Now, some of the objectives of our study was to successfully track a large pelagic uh, fish, like a sailfish, use the tags to monitor their movements uh, of them, and also track them throughout the year and see if there are any seasonal differences in their movements. Do the currents, do the temperatures of the ocean, do the seasonal changes in the currents and temperature influence the movements of these large fish? So <clears throat> we uh, selected the Pacific sailfish, a very attractive animal. It's related to marlins, spearfishes, as well as some of the Atlantic sailfish group. Uh, it's pelagic, meaning it lives out in the open ocean. And it's a predator. It eats fish. Uh, most prevalent billfish in the eastern Pacific, so there's plenty of them, and they're actively targeted by both recreational as well as commercial fishermen. We use these uh, PAT tags, as they're called, they're uh, pop-up archival tags, but we adapted them to also give us real-time signals so that every time this animal jumped out of the water, we would get a position on it. Uh, the reason we wanted this is we wanted to know if the tags were working. The other way that we're going to get information is we have it timed so that after a period of three to six to eight months, the tag actually automatically releases itself, floats to the surface, and then downloads that information, hopefully, to the satellite so that we can get the information that has been archived in the computer system on board the tag and then use that information. The only problem is then the location information is not as good. The location is not as good because now you're relying on a different system for triangulating and figuring out where the animals are. You're using the time of daylight and the time of sunset. Daylight and sunset are the two factors that are measured by a little light meter on the tag itself. So we wanted to get opportunistic transmissions from the fish every time they broke the surface. We wanted to also record their dive depths, find out how deep they go in the ocean, as well as the temperatures of the water that they're preferring. And we also wanted to compile the data and archive it in four-hour bits so that we could later discern it and look at it. Uh, this is Sam Fredericks over here. This is my colleague Steve Morreale, who is at Cornell. Both of these guys are the ones that did much of the work. I take all of the credit. Uh, <laughs> however, um, I always make sure that I give you a good look at them. They're both hardy men who've done a lot of really great work. And of course, uh, jumping in and out in the ocean with all the dangers associated with that is not an easy thing to do. So here's the study area right off the coast of Guanacaste, Costa Rica. Uh, this is the Pacific coastline of Costa Rica. You go out on boats with professional uh, sport fishermen. Uh, what you do is you ask permission of whoever has hired the boat for that day if they would like to have a scientist on board who would then put a special tag on the animal after it's caught and released. Uh, most people say, oh, wow, that's cool, yeah, that's great. And some people, I don't want anybody on the boat. But it's great because it reduces my costs. I don't have to hire the boat every day. And these sport fishermen then also get the excitement. Uh, we had a show that has uh, been on the Discovery Channel and another one that was on like Babe Winkleman Goes Fishing in Costa Rica type uh, show. <laughs> And those, uh, those shows are fun, but they also are informational. They give people information that is exciting and also gives them an insight as to what they're doing. 
Um, this is Sam at the release. We wanted to make sure the animal was healthy enough for release, and you can see he's holding the fish, swimming it through the water, and then it's released. You can see the satellite transmitter is right here floating uh, uh, adjacent to the animal. It's fairly small. It only weighs about, uh, I think it's 54 grams, so it's not very uh, cumbersome to these animals. And um, I'm going to see if this works. It goes real slow on this computer. I don't know why, probably because. But uh, we also videotaped the release so that we had uh, evidence of the animals when they're released. You can see the boat right there. The, uh, the first mate is holding the bill of the fish, and they're go moving the boat through the water. Uh, put, ram circulating oxygen over the gills so that they become oxygenated enough so that the animal is then released. Uh, it's kind of, uh, this is a very brief interlude where the fish is out of the picture, but it's taking a long time here. But I just wanted you to see the animal as it swims away. Uh, when you're underwater trying to hold your breath and snorkeling and trying to keep the fish and everything you want in the viewfinder, it's not easy. But um, you'll see the fish being released in a second or two and then it takes off. And this is all very uh, exciting work done by uh, Sam Fredericks. He's an excellent photographer. I've, uh, he's already published a number of his photographs. Uh, in a, a number of different forms, and uh, not only that, he's uh, turned into a first-rate biologist. So you can see the fish now is swimming away, um, and what you see, that white spot on this side of the fish is the anchor on the other side. We push it right through the fish, anchor it, and then it's uh, suspended on the other side and floating next to the fish. And you can see the beautiful sail right here is being uh, displayed, uh, basically telling anybody, hey, I'm big, stay away. And then you can see here as the animal swims away, that's, that's the tag and where it sits and how it rides next to the animal. And that's an important thing to note, too. I'm not going to play this very much longer here because um, it's just taking too long. The results are interesting. We've had animals and been able to track them for uh, upwards of over a thousand kilometers, uh, a number of different deployments. Uh, the deepest dive we found for these animals was about uh, 300 meters. So these animals are spending most of their time in the upper surface, but they can go down as deep as 300 meters. You can see they do migrate and move quite uh, quickly from point to point. Here's just some of the tracks after the animals have been released. So first thing we know is once they've been caught and then released, they are still alive. They do go and move and move in a normal way that they, we would normally expect them to do, to do. So the practices of these sport fishermen, which have been a point of contention for many conservationists as well, certainly is not something that is going to be overly detrimental to these animals in that we find they're doing their normal behaviors. You can see these are shooting right up here along the shelf up north towards Mexico. Some of them went down and are off the coast of Panama. So these animals are ranging and moving in many different directions. You don't have just one direct movement. And we do find that there are differences in where they go uh, seasonally. Uh, some of the diving behavior between June and August shows you that the majority of the dives are between 5 and 45 meters. So they're up in the top 45 meters of water. Few dives are fairly deep. Uh, in the winter, what you find is most of the dives are in 5 meters. They're, in the, they're restricted in the winter to the top surface waters. Why? The reason why is because if you look at the temperatures of the water, in the, in the summer, the temperature profile, you have warmer waters. This big orange swath goes down even as far as 40 to 50 meters, whereas in the, in the, in the wintertime, there's only a very shallow area 
up to about five meters where you have these warmer temperatures. So these are temperature affected fish. This is another important finding. We know now that their habitat becomes compressed in the wintertime. They're more in the surface. And this is important because a lot of longliners are telling us, well, we're not going to have an impact on your fish because we're only setting our, our nets or our, our hooks in the top five to 10 meters. Well, in the wintertime, that top five to 10 meters is very critical for these animals because that's where they're spending all their time. So they become susceptible to be, being bycatch. Now, one of the things you can do is if you fish in the wintertime, put your nets down around and your, your hooks down around 30 to 40 meters, and you'll have less of a chance of catching these and reducing bycatch. The question is, will they still catch the other targeted species they want as well? So we need to also look at those types of questions. But here's some of the practical application of just the basic science we're doing here and a very exciting finding for Sam and uh, the students that work on these projects. So some of the conclusions are that uh, we can use these types of transmitters to understand the movements of large pelagic fish. Uh, we can also apply these to other billfish such as marlin, and uh, swordfish, which are also prized. Uh, we can also learn a lot about their behavior. As I told you, they can move long distances over short periods of time. Their diving behavior changes, uh, but can be similar between seasons, but can be compressed in the wintertime. They spend most of their time above 15 meters of water, where, and they usually will take short dives down to deeper depths and um, this is possibly because they're chasing their game fish, which they're feeding on. Again, what we find is there's multinational uh, involvement that has to be uh, employed here to conserve these animals. Uh, the fact is that um, the Eastern Pacific sailfish doesn't stay in Costa Rican waters very long. It goes very quickly to Panama, uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico, and it can do that within a period of five to ten days. So the fact is that without international agreements, the conservation efforts of one country, if not co coordinated with another, are going to be useless. So commercial gear and their specifications can also be uh, worked on and looked at with regard to conservation of the species we want to protect and uh, this information that we can provide to these countries and their conservation organizations as well as their governmental agencies regulating fishing will become very important and uh, some of them we can do very easy modifications that would also reduce bycatch of other species as well as these important sailfish. Now I'm going to move on to turtles. Many of you came to listen about turtles. This is the national park and the outline of the national park in Costa Rica that was created in 1994 with a lot of effort from ourselves and people in Costa Rica. These dark green areas that extend inland are actually mangrove estuaries some of the most important wetlands in the world and are part of the national park but the major portion of the park are the beaches the major beach we work on is Playa Grande here's a picture of Playa Grande as I've said time and time again it's a tough place to go in November, December, January and February but somebody has to do this uh, this is uh, Playa Ventanas, this is Playa Grande and the marine station sits right here it's one of the few houses that has been built on the, on the beach. We had a very nice donor who gave us the money to purchase the property, Mr. Goldring, and we did and have converted a duplex into a marine station where students now can come and take courses. There have been uh, classes every year there from the University of Georgia, IPFW, from Stanford, uh, from Cornell University, from Drexel University. So it's being used uh, as an ed educational institution and in agreement with the, the uh, local government as well as the national government and Minai, which runs the national park system. Here's some photos of the students working. There's some really neat inshore habitats. 
uh, along the beaches. This is one of the rocky areas uh, on Playa Carbon. And you can see the students are looking in the tide pools for invertebrates. This is Jim Haddock, who's come down with me a number of times to work with the students. He's a professor in our uh, biology department, and thank God he knows what the invertebrates are because I don't really like dealing with them. Uh, and this is uh, Dan Loney, a, a teacher at Dwanger High School. Many of these students are here, as a matter of fact, at IPFW or at other universities. They get college credit, and we do take our own college students down there as well. They go on an estuary tour, so they get to see different types of habitats, including a mangrove estuary. I take them out on a sailboat, so we go out to an island which has a reef around it, so they get to see deep uh, ocean environments as well as a coral reef. Uh, of course, the lovely swimming pool is a favorite for most of them, but we do work with the government. This is the Minister of the Interior, um, their Minister of uh, Natural Resources, uh, pro proclaiming the opening of the Children's Festival on the closing of the season. There are seven species of sea turtles in the world. The largest is the leatherback. Uh, the average size of these animals is about 150 centimeters shell length. 150 centimeters is almost two meters. Okay, so they are pretty large. That's just the shell. That doesn't include the head part that sticks out and the flippers that stick, stick out as well. So these animals can get to be seven to eight feet in length and 13 to 14 feet across as they spread out their flippers. So they're, uh, in essence, they also weigh about uh, as much as a Volkswagen Beetle. They weigh about 500 kilograms, which is uh, over a thousand pounds. So <coughs> you're not going to very easily pick them up and move them around. <laughs> they come out on, all these sea turtles are uh, restricted. Uh, they live in the ocean, but they are dependent on beaches where they come out to reproduce. Uh, around the world, a number of beaches are, are found where these animals come out and dig a hole in the, in the sand after spending their entire life out in the ocean eating nothing but jellyfish, which is very interesting to me because, as we know, jellyfish really nutritionally don't have very much. They come in and they lay a nest on the sand, in the sand. They dig down about 75 centimeters. They deposit, for this species, about 60 to 80 eggs. All the eggs are about the size of a billiard ball. After depositing the eggs, the eggs are incubated underground for 60 days. Uh, and after that 60 days, they hatch. They seem to collect at the top of the nest and then collectively dig their way up out through the sand. So this is a pretty tough beginning to your life. You're buried underground and you got to dig your way out. A lot of that is very interesting and has been a part of the project that the students in the laboratory have worked on. They've looked at many different factors such as the oxygen concentration, the carbon dioxide, the energy costs of doing this, trying to dig up through the sand. So a lot of this has been very fascinating and uh, there have been over 20 students from IPFW who have completed master's projects working on areas uh, involving nesting and the overall ecology of these animals. Here's, a matter of fact, the class of IPFW students that went down last year. I don't know if any of these guys are in the audience, but they are actually IPFW students who you can still sign up till November 25th. There's a section on marine biology uh, that you can sign up for through continuing studies. Don't bother calling me, call them. Um, and it's uh, exciting because you do get to spend 10 days down in Costa Rica doing all those things that I outlined before. One of the exciting things is sometimes the turtles come up late, late in the morning, uh, just before dawn, and they stay out on the beach for 90 minutes. So uh, if they stay out that long, you can get some pictures because during the daytime you can take pictures. You can't take flash pictures at night in the national park. And so I took this opportunity. Notice it's following all the rules. They're all behind the head of the turtle and uh, very quietly sitting there. So I took this picture so I could have evidence of these guys actually doing something. <laughs>
Now, one of the things we found uh, started working down there intensively in 1988. Uh, the data that's been collected by these students as well as volunteers who've come down over the season is when we first started down there in 88, 89, season. They nest from October all the way through till uh, February. Uh, that there was about 1,500 individual females nesting there that year. And the they number stayed fairly constant. And then all of a sudden we had this precipitous drop. Well, we do see cycles in reproduction. And what you'll see is there's these precipitous drops every two to three years. And that's a natural phenomenon. That's got to do with the impact of the nutritional availability in the ocean that's impacted by El Nino La Nina. A lot of you have heard about El Nino and La Nina. It affects you right here in Indiana. We had a fairly mild summer uh, and one in which we didn't get very hot, but California's burning. When California burns, you have an El Nino year. All you have to do is go to California, light a cigarette, throw it into the the sagebrush and California burns. And that's basically what happens every time you have an El Nino year. In La Nina, they should be getting wet. And so then you'll read about the mudslides in California and how houses are rolling off the hills in uh, San Bernardino or whatever, because then you do get a rain pattern. So the ocean is influencing the climates and also the rainfall and what even happens here in Indiana. So. What we are noticing is it also influences these animals' reproductive cycles. Uh, an El Nino year is actually about 12 to 18 months prior to this precipitous drop. Why? Because the animals that are out there at that time do not have enough nutrition available for them to accumulate the fat reserves necessary to make the eggs and come back and nest. What has happened? Why has the population dropped from 1,500 down to last year we only had 59? It's not on this. I didn't have time to make a new slide because I haven't beat up a student hard enough to do it for me yet. But the fact is last year we had only 59 nesting females. Why also do we see more and more of these drop years and uh, instead of having two to three years intervals between El Ninos, they're coming like every other year. Well, that's all got to do with global warming. That's all got to do with what we're doing and impacting on these animals. And what's also happening is our fishing practices right about here in the 80s shifted. Instead of going out and getting billfish and tuna with, with uh, purse seining, we started, um, and that was because of our, you know, Charlie Tuna campaign. Uh, we don't want to eat, we want to eat uh, uh, dolphin safe tuna. So instead of catching a few dolphins, now we catch everything with long lines. And what happens there is you have a huge fish bycatch. You don't catch as many dolphins, you don't catch probably any dolphins, but you catch lots of everything else. And that's a real problem because it's decimating the ocean. The uh, problem is now all the females that have disappeared here uh, were being knocked off by getting caught as bycatched and drowning on these long lines. And the reason why it also dropped precipitously is for 20 years prior to the time we created the National Park in 1995, they were harvesting 100% of the eggs essentially that were being put on this beach. They were harvesting them and selling them. We say they were poaching them, but the local people would go out, take the eggs, and because there was a truck now, they could sell it to the guy on the truck, and they had a market to distribute it to on the other side and throughout the country of Costa Rica. So for 20 years, there was no reproductive output, no hatchlings going in the water. So as the females were dying off, either due to old age or because they were getting knocked off on the nets, there was no juveniles maturing to replace them. So you got a double whammy. The adults were being killed in record numbers where there weren't any real predators before. And also, for 20 years, there was no reproductive output by these populations. So in 1980, our estimates were that there were about 100,000 nesting leatherback females in the Pacific Basin. And by 2007, even till today, there's less than 3,000 uh, in the entire. So the 
Pacific has basically been decimated and leatherbacks have disappeared. So here's the animals as they come out. They dig their hole in a very ritualistic manner with their rear flipper. They deposit their eggs. And you can see here, this is back in the days when there were poachers. I took pictures that actually ride up on high-tech vehicles here to uh, <clears throat> reduce the time in between turtles. Um, so now they're getting caught and knocked off on long lines. They get caught on the hooks. They get caught in shrimp fisheries. And you can see here, this was a video that uh, we gave a hidden video camera to a guy who was a crew member. And they kept telling me, no, we don't catch any leatherbacks. He came back with 10 of them that were caught like this. And this guy here, they want to get their hook back. It's very valuable. It's like 57 cents. And uh, they hack off the flipper because they can't lift. The turtle's too big and too heavy to lift in the boat. So they just hack the flipper off so they can get their hook back. So it's, it's a problem, uh, and it's something that uh, we need to work on, and a lot of treaties are being developed, but this is what happens with these long lines. They're out there in the ocean. They're indiscriminately catching the target fish that you want to eat, but also catching turtles, uh, diving birds. They catch uh, a lot of uh, diving seals and sea lions as well. So it's, it's becoming a real issue in the ocean. Uh, some of the gill nets and gill fisheries locally along the shore also have a problem, especially in Asia. There is actually a jellyfish fishery there. They like to eat jellyfish. And if you realize that uh, leatherbacks eat about 90 kilograms of jellyfish a day, um, that's where you're going to find them. So when they're out there catching uh, jellyfish, they also can catch and, and kill um, leatherbacks as a byproduct. Now, the problem is, too, anybody here from California? Oh, Bruce, yeah, you're from California. If you uh, notice, there's been a lot of beach closures along the coast of California due to jellyfish. And people are perplexed. They want to know why there are so many jellyfish. Well, you take out 100,000 of these animals that eat 90 kilograms of jellyfish a day, you can figure out where these jellyfish we're going and why now they're in abundance because they do not have a top predator taking them out. So hopefully with the help of President Oscar Arias from Costa Rica and my colleague Jim Spatilla at Drexel and some of the other Congress people, we're helping to introduce laws and other agreements to help protect the beaches where they nest as well as international agreements to protect them from certain fishing practices. So we've created a, a national park and also a reserve in the ocean, one of the largest oceanic reserves, so that hopefully when these hatchlings come up and out of the sand, they have some place to go where they can be safe. Uh, just to give you an idea, these, are, these were exciting because we've now had the hatchery and been protecting the beach since 94. And we're just now starting to get the first females on the beach that have never been on the beach before. Why do we know that? Because they don't have one of our tags in them. And so this was one of the first that ever came up. She's really small. Notice, really small and me next to it. So this animal here was only about 135 centimeter shell length, which is the smallest we've ever seen. And they're starting to come up in that size. So we're starting to get recruitment. Many of those hatchlings that we put out have matured and are now returning. It takes about 14 to 15 years. So the trouble is, I do have one graduate student way in the back who's been here since, for the, since the start of this project who still hasn't finished. <laughs> so she's actually seen 14 to 15 years worth, right? Is that correct? <laughs> I'm expecting your thesis. See, this is my opportunity to embarrass her in public and hopefully receive something in writing from her. <laughs> Uh, we also do have students. Uh, Corey Kumagai here is working with uh, the American crocodiles that are also in there. So we have a diversity. We're working out in the ocean with fish, we're working in the estuary with crocodiles, and we're working on the beach and in the national park with these sea turtles. Uh, <clears throat> one of the real problems is when you develop a beach, you get all this light pollution. Everybody wants to cut down the vegetation, and they want to have lights because they're afraid. I don't know what they're afraid of. Maybe, you know, Nessie's going to come out of the ocean. But the fact is they should turn these lights off because they bother the turtles. 
The other thing is they leave their beach chairs out and the turtles come up, bang into the chairs, and they don't want to stay around there and nest. And this is a very simple study to show the impact of the houses in this area. What has happened is the normal elevation of the beach where the sand uh, is built up is reduced by the fact that they've cut out the vegetation in front of the houses so that they can sit in their kitchen or bedroom and look right out on the ocean at all hours. That, what it does is it prevents the growth that's normally there from holding on to the sand. So at high tide, the sand washes away. And so what has happened is the elevation of the beach in that area is less than a meter, allowing for the inundation of that entire beach by the high tide, which is lethal because once, if a, even if a turtle comes up and lays its nest there, it will then be inundated by the tide and covered with seawater, and seawater is lethal to the eggs developing down about a half a meter. So that's a real problem. So here's a study that shows uh, not only is the beach elevation down, but the number of turtles that nest in those areas has declined qu quite precipitously. And it's only in the middle here where you have the majority of the turtles nesting. And at the far end, the same thing. There's development over here and a reduction in the number of turtles that are nesting. In the middle of the beach where you have no houses, no vegetation has been removed, you have an elevation of the beach of almost four meters of s worth of sand and also an elevated berm. So in other words, the high tide never gets up and over this area where the turtles come up and nest, which there, this is uh, t about 20 meters out to here. So you have an elevated part of the sand for 20 meters, which gives them ample habitat for them to deposit their eggs in nests that are well above the high tide. And again, down here where the new housing has come in, you can see the beach is starting to erode and that elevated berm area is disappearing very quickly. So there's a very simple study done by Patricia Clune, who is now working for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. So our students come here, they go, they get these opportunities, and then they also go and work for the state of Indiana, looking at the impact of houses on, on waterways here in Indiana on lakes as well as on rivers. Here's our hatchery. You can see it's in above the berm. Here's vegetation as well. And this is where we transport the nests that are laid in the areas where the high tide inundations would be lethal to them to protect them and hopefully increase the output of hatchlings. Here's some of the students actually working and doing something for a change other than eating and sleeping. And here, are the, of course, are the eggs. <clears throat> uh, we weigh and measure them, give us an idea of the reproductive output. And over 600 nests have been protected on an average year in those uh, uh, over the f years with about 20,000 additional hatchlings produced and released. So we're doing our part to help protect the environment. Here's many of the students who've been involved and worked on these projects. Some of their parents might actually recognize them. I don't know if these are from the year your kids went down or not. <clears throat> and hopefully these hatchlings will come back in 14 years as adults. The shot we have right now indicates that for every 1,000 hatchlings that are released, only one survives to adulthood to come back. Some of the other things we've done with these turtles is, of course, how do I know they weigh 500 kilograms? Well, we actually weigh them out there on the, on the beach. We actually have tracked these guys. You can see that the transmitters have evolved all the way from to very small little earring-like appendages here on the back, uh, well, also little backpacks. And we've tracked the animals throughout the Pacific using satellite telemetry and also with these light uh, temperature depth recorders that we can remove later on so the animal has to return to the beach we don't get a signal going up to a satellite what we have found is consistently they follow turtle highway number one uh, they all went to AAA before they came there and it said when you leave the beach and you take off follow this road and what it find is it's a very important under uh, in the ocean there are contours, bathymetric contours. This is a mountain range. The Pacific Plate is crashing into the 
Caribbean plate causing the production of this, what's known as the Cocos Ridge. This Cocos Ridge has become very important, and this area outlined by the dotted uh, lines is interesting because uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Costa Rica have now signed a, an international agreement to protect their exclusive economic zone, which extends out 20 miles from their uh, shorelines. But what's also strategic is the Cocos Islands, the Galapagos Islands, Malpelo, Gorgona, and Coiba, these islands off the coast extend the exclusive economic zone so that this entire area outlined here is encompassed by the exclusive economic zones of these countries. And this is now the largest marine wildlife preserve created. It's actually the only one that I know of, but it's there. And uh, it's difficult to enforce the laws there, but at least there are laws saying that certain type of fishing cannot occur at different times in the year. Here's some of the track tracks we've had. We always thought that the leatherbacks from Mexico and Costa Rica actually went up and were eating jellyfish right off of Monterey Bay, California. There's lots of jellyfish up there that have been known for years. The only problem is all of them go south. And it was a perplexing question as to why, where these animals came from. They actually come from 3,000 kilometers away, all the way across the Pacific Ocean in Papua, New Guinea. So they actually nest <coughs> on beaches in the Pacific on the other side. So they come all the way across the Pacific just to come over here and forage and then go all the way back. These animals range across the entire ocean, which is very interesting. <clears throat> and also these animals come down and are mostly pelagic down here off the coast of South America. Here's some more tracks showing you the same type of pattern. These are, uh, are adult turtles that were captured off a boat by a colleague uh, <clears throat> and um, Scott Benson and then you can see they're heading back towards uh, their nesting grounds. The same thing is true here. We have tracked more turtles. They all follow Turtle Highway 1 until they reach the Galapagos, and then somehow the maps, they all go any which way. Uh, I don't know. It must be that there are different holiday inns throughout the Holiday Inn Expresses for these gals to follow. Now, what's interesting is, are the surface currents influencing these movements? Not that much. Not that much in that we know that basically during a normal year, the northern equatorial current comes across here, and these animals are traversing right across that current. But just to give you a little lesson in oceanography, normally the winds in this area all push towards this direction and uh, towards Australia and um, Asian archipelago. But in an El Nino year, it all changes, and the wind direction shifts and the warm water that's up at the surface is all pushed towards the North American, Central American, and South American continent. This is what causes the El Nino effect. If we look at the productivity here, this is a satellite photograph. The light green and yellow colors are due to the presence of chlorophyll, and that chlorophyll is being produced by algae that are suspended in the water when you have a normal year or a La Nina, there's lots of chlorophyll, lots of primary productivity. But when the winds change in the El Nino and the warm water comes here, this is all warm water, the bioproductivity in terms of plant material goes almost to zero. That's the dramatic effect that causes a, a real stress on these animals and an inability for them to harvest food. And it's a real problem. It's part of the natural cycle in the ocean but it's happening now much more often. Here's another experiment just to let you know we don't just work with leatherbacks. This is a Pacific green turtle. This is a doctoral student who's been working with me, Gabriela Blanco, uh, with uh, ultrasound machine. And we are ultrasounding her so we can check her ovaries out. Uh, we've been getting smarter and smarter. You don't want to put a $5,000 transmitter on a turtle that may come up 10 days later to nest again and some idiot comes along and takes your transmitter and then you're basically tracking them as they go back to their house. 
So we wait until their, all their eggs are gone. It's also given us an insight into their reproductive cycle. It was thought these animals only nested three times a year. We're finding they nest six to seven times a year. So we are checking their ovaries. When their ovaries are completely empty, as you see in the bottom photographs, then we put a transmitter on the animal, and the animal goes out and gives us some information, not only about their internesting habitat, where they're found, uh, and this is from a, a, a beach called Jesus Beach. And we know where they're spending their time during their internesting air times. And also getting an uh, idea of how deep they dive, where they dive to, and how many minutes they can stay down as long as 90 minutes. So they can hold their breath pretty well as a, an animal. So we have their internesting habitats, but we also have their migration. You can see here this turtle has come all the way down, all the way up, and is then up here in a bay north of Honduras. So they do migrate and move great distances. We also have another one that went all the way down along the coast and is sitting in an estuary in Panama. So there are some that migrate north, some that migrate south. These are very interesting findings. And again, looking at the duration of the dives during the migration versus when they're hanging out in their foraging areas is very interesting for comparison. So we can find out now that there are foraging areas up here in Honduras, also in the Gulf of Papagayo, and down along the Panama areas. So for protection of these animals, uh, protecting these foraging areas becomes important and also protecting the migratory routes between those foraging area become important. Um, this was a 13 and a half foot American crocodile that I caught because Corey said he didn't have enough big crocodiles in his study because when he went out he kept catching these little ones. So I went out with two of my colleagues from the National Park. This is a former student got his master's degree. His name is Rodney Pietra and his assistant Guillermo, and we went out and got him a really big one. <laughs> uh, right now, I, I have a postdoctoral research associate, uh, John Rowe, who's in the audience, and he's doing some very exciting analysis, which is taking those tracks that you saw of those leatherbacks, understanding where they are seasonally and temporally in the ocean, and then overlaying on top of that the different types of fishing pressure which includes the tuna fishery, the billfish fishery, swordfish fishery, and then, then trying to find hot spots. These are areas of, of uh, important interaction between the fisheries and the turtles. Hopefully now, when, by identifying these hot spots, we can find some way in which uh, conservation management can occur, which will reduce the impact of some of these fisheries on the movements and migrations of these turtles in the ocean. It's a very exciting new development, again, using uh, computer technology, and uh, John has done an excellent job of that. Uh, a lot of our students have been down there. I don't know if any of you guys know Chris Barlow. Uh, Chris Barlow uh, did her master's degree working here with Bruce Kingsbury, but she also came down and worked with me for a while down in Costa Rica and got into education, working with the students in the schools, and now I think, is she still the education coordinator at Fox Island, or has she moved on? She ins instructs over uh, across the street at Ivy Tech. Okay. <laughs> well, she's around. So our students are productive. They seem to become taxpayers. Unlike the one student I have in the back row, the, uh, the, who is still not handed in her thesis. We also work with uh, local kids to make their conservation awareness as high as possible. We've also worked with beer companies, Guinness. So if you're going to drink beer, drink Guinness. Because they gave us uh, $42,000 to build a national park headquarters down there in Costa Rica. And just to let you know that all these young people have been very instrumental in gathering this data that makes me look like I do an awful lot of work. Most of the time when I'm down there, I'm supporting our sponsors like Guinness. <laughs> so hopefully when the sun sets in Costa Rica, it will not be on the last leatherback. So let's not say farewell. And now, just a quick statement. 
I'm going with the Chancellor to China. One of the reasons why is to hopefully get to work with some of these young pandas that are starting now to mature and will be released into the wild. So I was there uh, almost two years ago and they are now getting old enough so we're going back with the Chancellor and we'll be able to sign agreements with the Panda Research Center to exchange. One of their students hopefully will come here and we'll do a project tracking this panda and a few others that will be released into the wild and understanding how well they're adapting to being released. Thank you very much. See, it's, it's before one. I, I ended on time. Are there any questions? This is what I like. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. With the turtles um, cross the ocean, do they, are they um, mostly on top of the water? Yeah, they swim in the top 50 meters. They very rarely dive down deep. Now, what's interesting is sometimes, uh, especially the males, when they're migrating back, they'll go and they'll hit an eddy where there's lots of jellyfish, jellyfish and they'll stay there and they'll dive down. What's really amazing is these leatherbacks will dive down as deep uh, as some of the deepest diving sperm whale. I have a 780 meter dive by one of these leatherbacks. That's, you know, that's a significant depth. Uh, so they're going down as deep as sperm whale go. And the question is, what are they going down there that deep for? Well, when you get down there that deep, there's a very deep scattering layer where there are tons of jellyfish sitting. So uh, we know that they go down there we suspect now the reason they're going down there is to feed on some of these giant jellyfish species that are found down in this deep scattering layer. Yes? On the, um, the race that you had a year or so yes, ago? Yes, yes. Um, there was a, some turtles that were like twirling, is that what they were doing? Eating yeah, jellyfish? they were just probably hanging out and eating. The ones that were twirling too were hanging out because they came back and re-nested. Uh, and they less, actually left about 10 days later. But yeah, they'll do that. They'll hang out. Uh, the, that twirling was... Uh, the next great turtle race, by the way, will be uh, probably next uh, March, April. And it will be following turtles coming out of Bioko Island off the coast of Africa. Yes, in the back. Um, I have a question about when you're uh, move nests that are dangerous. Right. Are you seeing a difference output in the number of uh, hatching success? Yeah. Uh, hatching success in these guys is very low in the first place. It's usually only about 50% of the eggs deposited will hatch. And we're finding that uh, there's not a significant drop. There, there's a trend. Uh, we only get about 42% of the eggs hatching, but instead of 50%. But that's a fairly limited sample size, but there's no real significant decline. Uh, I got in a big debate with one of my students because one year it was 39%, and that would be significant. But if you do it over the number of years that we've done it, it comes out to fairly close to the same. As a matter of fact, last year, where we only had 12 nests in the hatchery, I think we had, what, a 75% hatching success. So I told her, see, it's better to, to move the nest. And she, of course, became very indignant with me. But it's, it's, a trend. it's a trend downward, but the other factor is there would be zero hatching success if they were left in situ. So although it's not a significant impact, it's something that we would not like to have do if we didn't have to. Yes. Any more questions? Yes, sir. How do they reconnect with their mothers? Since you made they don't. No, there's absolutely no reconnection that we know of. However, uh, genetic studies, I had a student who did some genetic studies, indicate that um, there are, is, you know, they, they are genetically, you know, if you look at them, you can find daughters and mothers come back to the same beach. And there's a definite genetic link between them. Uh, are they hanging out in the same areas? Do they, you know, go find mom after they become adults? Because certainly the foraging area for the juveniles is much different than the foraging area for the adults. The juveniles, which are small and the size of your palm, are in uh, areas that are not way out in the open ocean. 
where the mothers are. So 12 years later, when they're about the same size, they might be going to the same places. I don't know if they hook up again, uh, but that's something that remains down the road. Huh? They're all independent. Uh, they tend to, they, as I told you, when they leave, they all seem to follow the same route. But once they get to one point, they, after the Galapagos, they seem to spread out and um, they sp seem to use much of the Southern Ocean. So there's no real, everybody goes to the same place or let's all follow Gertie, she knows where she's going. Uh, there's none of that kind of stuff going on that we can detect from, uh, we have fairly limited number. We only have tracked about 40 to 50 total animals. So, but what we do see in those 40 to 50 animals is they're not once they hit a certain point, they tend to disperse throughout the ocean. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and I hope you guys left some peak. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. I'm wondering, when, when you're talking about tracking them, you, it usually, um, like when you've been talking to us for the other stuff, they usually talk about tracking the females to study the reproductions because obviously saving the hatchlings is um, a priority, but when you're tra um, tracking for their behavior, for where they go and what they eat, do you track the males ever? Do you have any idea how the males run into the females? And, and we don't track the males out of Costa Rica. The only reason is, is because the males don't come out of the water. Uh -huh. We put all this stuff on them as they come out to nest, so that's, that's given us a captive population of nothing but females. However, some males have been tracked uh, who have been caught out in the open water off of Monterey Bay. They seem to do the similar things, but um, you can see where the females made a beeline and headed right back to the beach. They kind of spun around and were doing all kinds of other things. So the fact is the males uh, probably have similar behaviors but aren't as tied as the females are to getting to the nesting beach and then after that coming back. So um, we don't have very much. There's only been about four males that have ever been tracked. Uh, and they, some of them never leave. Now, the, all the females left, and the male stays at the nest, uh, at the, uh, off of Monterey Bay and just hangs out there eating. Uh, so he didn't feel like going back. Uh, we don't know that we believe that mating does occur on the foraging grounds and that there are some males that follow the females back for whatever reason to also mate with them. But once they've made it, they don't usually don't go back all the way because why swim all the way the heck back over there when all the food's over here? So they only go as far as they have to to get, get good with the females. Okay? Did you guys leave me some pizza? That's all I want to know. If not, thank you very much for your kind attention.